esteemed ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session. The subject matter is a fad, if not a, a hype, and so we have uh, one hour of uh, 15 minutes allocated to it, though it is so fashionable that uh, we hear the news uh, that are the news uh, of the future, and uh, it is indicative of the intentions like what bank, what broker, what exchange rate, and what institute uh, have not uh, stated that they are working for it, and the things are changing, and the, there will uh, be industrial revolution four after the first uh, three, third being associated with computers. We have uh, brought together the people with, of high intelligence, uh, and they're so intelligent that they can talk about uh, artificial intelli intelligence. Uh, Susan A. Athey, professor of economics, stands for the university. She has an experience of implementing different technologies. I was highly impressed uh, with uh, the order of uh, the British uh, government uh, to increase uh, the collectability of fines, and uh, her technology provided that. Uh, then have, we have Mr. Vidahin, who is uh, senior vice uh, president of Sberbank, and uh, he is responsible for the AI in this uh, company. I think uh, Mr. Grimm is responsible for the natural intelligence, and Alexandra is responsible for artificial intelligence. And uh, it was uh, mentioned that one of the major national banks uh, is well advanced in uh, this area, ahead of the others. We have Alexei Minin, uh, who is from Deloitte, and uh, they built uh, the highest uh, practice of implementation of uh, the state-of-the-art technologies. And uh, he's, uh, he knows about uh, robotization because he sees uh, not only the end uh, users, uh, but uh, the businesses. Ivan Vasilyets, he is not only the associate professor, professor of uh, Skolkov Institute, he is a uh, doctor of uh, maths, and Alexei is a uh, doctor of maths as well. And he is one of the uh, people who knows about uh, the subject matter more than the others at the scientific level. It is the purview of his uh, interest. Ms. Natalia Parmanova from SAP CIS, uh, they are providing ERP practices to process big data using AI. And uh, Lee, Mr. Lee Schneider, advisor, Debbie Was uh, and Plimpton. And, uh, we will talk about him because the previous session was uh, quite an interesting. It was on what is the role of the regulator in the development of the new technologies. So regulations and uh, what are the legal practices and what the regulators are planning, that's what we are going to start with. So let us uh, start uh, with Susan. Oh, no, sorry. Let, let me define the subject matter. Well, let's have a definition of artificial intelligence. If ants are doing some work collectively, building some structures and uh, ant hills, or there are clever dogs that take some decisions uh, on the difficult uh, situations, or there's a calculator who is faster than us. And if, uh, if I ask how many seconds in hour, I think uh, they will give me an answer, which is, uh, slower than the calculator, but uh, it is enough for me. One, two, three, four seconds. If I ask how many seconds uh, in 24 hours, then I think the calculator would beat us. Is it uh, intelligence? What is uh, the borderline between AI and what we call automation? So let us start uh, from you, Susan. It's a very difficult question and quite philosophical. I'm an economist, so maybe I'll be more practical to begin. There are a number of different technologies that people are calling artificial intelligence today. I think in the financial sector, probably the most common implementation really could be called automation. Just when a, a, a startup, a fintech, might say they're doing artificial intelligence, but when you look behind the scenes, it's just a series of rules. If this, then that. If this, then that. 
And really, for most of what we should be doing in the financial sector, that's the place to start, automating previously manual processes. Where we've seen the most advance in science in the last 10 years is in what I would call just general machine learning. And that is about mostly prediction and classification, recognizing faces, recognizing images. Sometimes these things sound complicated, but as long as I can tell an algorithm whether you're, that it can try to optimize an objective, that you're right or wrong, or this is a cat or a dog, if I can make a simple objective, I can train a very complicated algorithm to do an amazing job with that simple objective. But I think it can be very confusing to people. You read in the newspaper about this great artificial intelligence, but, but there's a difference between what's easy and what's hard. What's easy is something where I have a simple objective. I know when I got it right or wrong. And then I have a very complicated algorithm to try to figure out, is this a cat or a dog? Will you pay your loan or not pay your loan? But the, the, the methods work very well when the problem is simple. And that's where most of the science is, getting really, really good at telling cats from dogs. <laughs> that's what we're good at. What is, what I think you imagine when you think about AI is something much more complicated. And there, the science is really much less advanced. If someone tells you they're solving a very complicated problem, you should be skeptical. And so what, I, what do I think are complicated problems? Well, robotics, self-driving cars, uh, even search engines are much more complicated systems. And there, we are much less advanced in the science. So we saw in search engines, for example, I worked for many years at the Bing search engine. We would make a small test for 1% of users, but if we released the, the algorithm to all users, we would get a very different response because the algorithms would change the data that you, were, you could use to train, and suddenly, if you never showed a certain type of result, you stopped learning about those results, and then you started making different kinds of mistakes. So complicated systems, systems with feedback, were much less sophisticated on, even though we imagine that's what artificial intelligence sounds like. So I think for the financial sector, we need to keep a healthy skepticism and realize that even someone comes out with a PhD from Stanford University, brilliant in machine learning, if you tell them to build a credit model, they don't understand about that with credit models, it's a, it's a system. If you change the credit rules, then different people will get a loan, and then the performance of the model will change. So you might think about that as true artificial intelligence, un a system that understands itself, but the science is, is, is not progressed there yet, and that would be really an open area for new research. Спасибо большое, Сьюзан. Я прошу теперь, поскольку Сьюзан сказал, что этот вопрос достаточно философский. Since Susan said that this issue is philosophical, we won't indulge ourselves with philosophy. So, Alexandra, a more practical question for you. Sberbank invested a lot into developing automation systems, and now you're talking about AI. What, what's the approach? What, where is the borderline between automation and what you refer to as uh, artificial intelligence? Thank you. I think uh, we should uh, make between two types of AI. One is the, uh, versatile AI, and that's what uh, the major hype about it. It is some kind of Skynet, uh, robots coming, conquering people. Uh, it is not available and uh, it won't be here in the near future. So we should not talk about versatile artificial intelligence and the terrible things that the mankind might be expecting in the near future. There's no need to uh, involve in uh, our engage in the discussion with Elon Musk. Let me remind you what uh, he said if the developed uh, system is given the task uh, to fight spam, then most probably the AI will uh, be fighting with people, even uh, might be uh, demolished, demolishing, destructing them. Yes, uh, there are many uh, science fiction stories uh, 
about this thing, but uh, luckily we are at uh, the happening that uh, has been organized by our regulator, the Bank of uh, Russia, and let us talk about this specific uh, AI which uh, addresses uh, specific uh, concrete tasks, and that's uh, what we should uh, focus uh, on because it is from this uh, artificial intellect that uh, we get most of the benefits and uh, definitely it is uh, not uh, so horrible for the mankind. Uh, we looked into the mathematics uh, system that is uh, available and uh, into the neuron uh, networks and uh, there are a number of uh, solutions available and these are the methods uh, of uh, artificial uh, intelli intelligence in our perspective. So addressing tasks uh, then with the help of uh, AI, it is uh, developing different systems of AI, full stop. And uh, after the definition is uh, proper, all the magic is uh, gone. There are regressions, uh, linear, log, logical regressions. We just made one step uh, further and uh, we started uh, to use more advanced uh, methods uh, with uh, processing more data and those uh, methods uh, have a, a name and they are referred to in among the mathematicians as machine learning and uh, machine learning does not strike the chord of excitement and uh, anticipation and uh, so that's what the mathematicians would like to call it machine learning and uh, those uh, who are overexcited with the robots uh, fighting man that's uh, let it be artificial intelligence uh, good hype but it is just uh, uh, the array of of good methods uh, and uh, we still use these are the methods of the 60s uh, of the 20th centuries those uh, who have the mathematical education are aware that uh, neural networks uh, were developed in the 60s and uh, boosting was the, developed in the 80s and uh, right now we just uh, have uh, uh, the more advanced algorithms and that's it sorry if i have uh, disappointed uh, you okay we are, we we are still talking about machine learning and do you know what it can uh, teach yourself what it they can learn like you know kids uh, children are not taught to lie but starting like 6 7 they learn themselves i think uh, they are being taught and uh, they they are getting they are observing the reactions and if uh, they can get uh, the neural network, if uh, they get a reward and uh, then, so it is uh, just a matter of the point of view whether the children are taught to lie or not. We must be giving them the feedback for them to respond. So the boundary is uh, where the technology starts uh, to learn. There's a deep machine learning or machine learning with uh, parameters, a transformation of uh, parameters and uh, some kind of transit uh, at the output. We are experimenting with deep machine learning, which is uh, closer to definition of AI, but uh, our algorithm with machine learning are just a set of parameters on the basis of new neural networks and some output parameters. Okay, uh, here is a client who is asking for a service, uh, and first of all, uh, why do they ask it? Is it for optimization? Competitive edge uh, saving, or do they do they mean what they mean under it, Michael? Thanks, uh, Alexander. I've uh, been in machine learning for 15 years. I don't have any romantic emotions uh, about it, and uh, I don't think that the machines will come and uh, destroy us. And uh, there was an. Uh, approximate of neuron systems and in Minsk uh, an article about uh, perceptron not being the approximate and then another article that uh, two T perceptron is an uh, universal approximator. Well, I think uh, our listeners uh, will uh, 
take a lot from this session, but, uh, well, it's a simplified uh, version of the story. I won't go into more details. For me, no artificial intelligence. It is just uh, another class uh, of algorithm that are bio-inspired. What is new neural network? When Indian scientists uh, well, uh, looked into the structure of the uh, brain. He said uh, that uh, there are cells and uh, cognitive uh, properties could be imparted uh, to it. That's uh, how the neuron networks uh, came into being. And uh, so these are just uh, bio-inspired approaches uh, to mathematics. Uh, what are your clients expecting from you when they come to you and they said, we would uh, like to get artificial intelligence? There is a hype. When we started to uh, deal with that in 2005 and 2006, nobody, was, nobody knew the word neuron networks. And now many want to have it and uh, reasonable. There is a number of the... Uh, tasks uh, to apply those. It uh, can save resources. Neural networks uh, help in 70% uh, to increase uh, performance and uh, they can increase the share at the market uh, due to different uh, elements and in 10% they can uh, transform business models. So it is uh, just optimization, selection of uh, correct strategies and marketing. I do not uh, see any constraints uh, to applications uh, of AI, but uh, there are uh, four tiers of algorithms. I do not want to use uh, the term AI, but uh, are they expecting a lot from you? Do they need any prompts or solutions? Uh, handling artificial intellect is just upbringing a child. You don't know what will be in the long run, what will happen. and. Uh, we were doing the developing the algorithm uh, and then when we used the, the portfolio of the optimum uh, seeding sowing we uh, have increased the, their prof uh, profitability and uh, not carrots but potatoes maybe okay saving time our next uh, round uh, will be closer to finances uh, ivan I'm under the impression that uh, artificial intelligence is something that the intelligence that uh, will look like uh, a human. It is uh, developing the cognitive uh, properties, uh, neural network, uh, genes, and is it uh, intelligence is uh, associated with the body? The more mature the body is, uh, the higher is the intelligence. So we do not know what is uh, the other type of intelligence, and we cannot even model it. And we are on the verge of its emergence. Thanks uh, for inviting. I'm the only representative of uh, the scientific community. He is, uh, well, next to you is doctor of mathematics as well. He is a doctor of mathematics, but unfortunately, he is uh, not in the science business anymore. OK, how are scientists uh, inspired? It is uh, from humans' activity in nature. And uh, the neural networks uh, is uh, a simplified uh, model of the human brain, so, though we do not know how the brain works. Uh, Roger Penrose used to say that the brain uh, works like a microscopic quantum system. We do not know how the human brain works, uh, but we try to put our ideas of how the brain works into computers. Now, neuron networks have emerged, uh, and now hype has um, appeared, and I should probably explain why this hype has um, arisen. It was based on the technology of deep learning. It began uh, in about 2006. All the algorithms uh, of it had existed before. Uh, Jeffrey Hilton had written about it, uh, but there was no such hysteria about it. So what happened uh, was a simple thing. It all began, just like Susan said, uh, from uh, telling a cat uh, uh, from a dog. At that time, machines were very bad uh, at doing this, and a lot of money was uh, invested uh, in it. And uh, the joke was, we need it takes a million dollars 
and uh, five um, doctors uh, of engineering to tell a dog from a cat. Um, so about well, but later the accuracy uh, was uh, raised from 60 percent to 99 percent because new. Uh, no new algorithms uh, were initially invented, but uh, uh, open uh, da data sets um, uh, appeared, uh, like uh, the ImageNet, uh, some 10 million annotated images uh, compiled by people, and it appeared that uh, the earlier algorithms um, that did not work very well uh, learned to perform better. Um, as uh, more data was fed uh, to them. And then uh, uh, there was uh, cheap uh, hardware that could be used uh, for neuron networks. And these factors uh, led to a considerable increase in accuracy and an increase in the number of people um, working on that and an ec ecosystem um, was formed of researchers working on the same task. Normally, uh, in science, every science team is working on a small issue, but here, uh, some 400 to 500 uh, research groups uh, began to address the same task, uh, and the spread of results uh, was uh, fantastically fast. Um, uh, if an article was published in late 2016, everyone knew it by March 2017 and were using it. So an ecosystem emerged and people began to think where else to use those methods. From images, they went to the voice and um, processing of the natural language and talking of the real artificial intelligence. Um, well, the most uh, uh, well-known example is when a computer was playing uh, the game of Go, uh, and uh, it's uh, of interest because you uh, have an agent here, a computer program as, that is going to make uh, uh, decisions with reinforcement learning. No one knows exactly how to prepare or train it. It takes five to ten talented people to create a working algorithm. Google Deep DeepMind is advanced uh, more than others, but um, this uh, seems to be the most promising uh, direction. Now, uh, talking of uh, how artificial intelligence is similar to uh, man. Um, and uh, I um, heard a presentation by a professor from MIT. Uh, they uh, took a brain signal uh, and uh, or several brain signals and compared them uh, to the output of the, some standard uh, neuron networks like AlexNet and it appeared that the signals were similar for similar tasks. So uh, people uh, were working for the neuron networks that we had uh, taught using data. But if you take the newer networks, then there's no longer similarity. So we have found something or invented something that you cannot find directly or immediately in the human brain. So there's something specific to, to AI. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Natalia, one of your projects um, uh, I uh, took a deep interest in it, um, <coughs> the um, emergence of big data and uh, the fact that the more data there are for an algorithm, the more accurate it is. And earlier we had, uh, we were missing that access to everything. And you had a project uh, with a company that decided uh, to uh, look uh, at the world of fashion uh, using big data and began to study all the international magazines and websites. Um, uh, perhaps uh, they decided um, to sell sari in Europe, because if you look at big data, you will find um, uh, a lot of uses, uh, say, in India or in China of what may not be quite um, good for Scandinavia. But if you limit uh, this um, uh, area, then uh, you lose the advantages of big data. 
thank you. Uh, thank you in the first place for inviting me here. And it was uh, very interesting for me to listen to scientists uh, because at SAP we um, uh, uh, treat uh, machine learning more pragmatically. Uh, that is from the perspective of specific business scenarios. What we uh, see uh, today in terms of using AI in business is that we are going away from uh, direct and uh, rigid programming of algorithms uh, to the algorithms of uh, neural networks, which enable us not only to solve uh, certain um, uh, rigidly programmed uh, tasks, but also more flexible tasks. Um, the project you mentioned uh, had to do with analysis of big data and networks, and the task was simple. Uh, it was to follow the trends in fashion. There are some uh, uh, 100 relevant, fashion relevant or fashion conscious uh, countries with uh, an average of 100 fashion magazines uh, published in each of them and 100 websites dedicated to it and companies that uh, make fashion products. So the idea was to define uh, more accurate or determine, determine more accurate, accurately which model is going to be the most popular. It was based on machine learning and designers put fed a lot of data into it uh, to focus on the most popular trends. In answer to your question, I believe that artificial intelligence uh, will continue under human control for a long time and will remain an assistant than the final decision maker. So when you get a set of uh, nations that are of interest to you or the set of magazines uh, or websites that are of interest to your audience, uh, you give a tempo to the machine. But will the machine learn itself? It will gradually, um, and I agree with my colleagues in that the way these algorithms are built, that is uh, uh, with neuron uh, networks that are capable of producing new signals and creating new connections to provide us with more accurate solutions. Uh, but the most important thing is um, uh, for machine uh, recommendations to be um, enjoying uh, to enjoy people's trust uh, so that people trust uh, machi the machine's um, decisions. Uh, what comes to my mind uh, is that maybe 15 years ago, people did not uh, trust uh, credit cards very much. They preferred to keep their money under the pillow or the mattress. Uh, but now it sounds absurd if uh, someone keeps uh, their savings at home. So our neuron networks should uh, uh, learn to adapt to neuron uh, networks. So later on, those electronic neural networks uh, will um, acquire the faculty of taste. All right. Um, and now, uh, uh, in terms of regulation, is there a definition of artificial intelligence? For example, AI has made an error uh, from the perspective of um, the regulator or the consumer. Who should be sued, the bank, the provider, or the technology developer? How is this uh, regulated today? for having me at this event. This has been a terrific event. I was here yesterday, great, great panels, and I've been uh, really enjoying myself in Sochi. Uh, before I answer the question about who should be sued, and for some reason everybody asks lawyers who should be sued, I'm not the kind of lawyer who's interested in suing people. I'm the kind of lawyer who's interested in helping people figure out how to do things the right way. Let me just talk about artificial intelligence in, in two ways right now. Uh, the first way is um, we, can, we can think of ourselves, we can think of our world as being the sum of data points. And as we heard from the scientists and others on the panel, data is hugely important for artificial intelligence. And the reason it's hugely important is because artificial intelligence or the algorithms that are 
embedded in the processes and in the out and in creating the outputs for artificial intelligence are analyzing that data. So if we think of ourselves, if we think of our lives as a sum of data, and we think of artificial intelligence as taking all of that data and analyzing it, pulling data from the rest of the world and analyzing it, maybe that's a one way that we can think about how artificial intelligence works. So when the regulators in the US are thinking about artificial intelligence, thinking about this data analysis that's going on, what they're thinking about is how can that be supervised in the same way that human beings should be supervised. We have this concept in the US in the federal securities laws of supervision where there is a pyramid effect uh, and people within the organization are supervised by people higher up in the organization, either with more training or more knowledge or more learning. And so thinking about supervising artificial intelligence in the same way, how do you properly supervise artificial intelligence raises some, some really interesting questions. Um, the, the second thing I wanted to say about... about but maybe, as Anatoly has suggested um, at the end of the previous panel, you could uh, introduce similar systems uh, at the level of the regulators, AI-based system. For example, there's the RegTag uh, concept of modern um, regulation technologies. And I think the regulators, certainly in the U.S., are looking at artificial intelligence as a way to carry out their supervisory responsibilities. And so you'll, you, we may end up in a world where artificial intelligence has far outstripped human capabilities such that we are asking the computers to supervise us rather than us supervising the computers. That's probably way off in the future, I think, Yvonne, you said that. Um, but in, in thinking about it right now, what people are looking at, what regulators are looking at, is how human beings will perform the supervision of the artificial intelligence. It, let, let me make a sef second point about artificial intelligence and data, which is training. Um, we train human beings in financial services to do their job, and the same thing happens with artificial intelligence, with machine learning, whatever you want to call it. So we feed it data and we train the algorithms based on the outputs of that data. And that kind of training is, is very important for the success of any type of artificial intelligence. But you need that training also to be context specific. Let me give you a simple example of that. Since I got to Russia, I've eaten about 100 blini. Um, and I love blini, not only because they taste great, but because when I was growing up, my mother made virtually every Saturday morning for breakfast something that we called blintzes, which is the Polish word for blini, uh, part of my family. My mother's family is originally from Poland. So what does that tell us about being context specific? What it tells us is I grew up in one context, the context of blintzes. I came to Russia to another context, the context of blini, and it's important that even though blini and blintzes are very similar, it's important to recognize that the context in which both of them exist is different. And the same thing has to be done for artificial intelligence, in part because it will interact with different human beings who have different needs or desires or goals, and in part because it's going to happen in different countries and different places around the world. Thank you very much. Now from Blinis and Blinces, let's uh, go over to the financial world. Alexander, normally when you talk about uh, the products that uh, are subject um, uh, uh, to uh, artificial intelligence, um, like risk management, um, uh, uh, maybe credibility or uh, 
trading because uh, algo trading and robo advising are possible. They are two elements of the same chain. Or uh, uh, savings on calls like chatbots instead of uh, taking standard questions or marketing and cross-marketing. What is Sparebank doing now? What did you begin from and where do you see? Or what are you going to do first and then second? What are you planning for later? A good question. What uh, we uh, began from, as a matter of fact, uh, neurosets uh, have uh, one very important uh, faculty that's uh, in the interpretability of uh, the results of uh, neural networks. When you get a, an, an output from a neural network, then you wonder whether this is uh, correct and right. Uh, when you um, tell a cat from a dog, uh, uh, the question does not arise because your own uh, brain uh, checks it uh, and you feel you understand it. But when there are complex solutions with high credit risks, this is not so obvious. So we begin uh, uh, embedding artificial intelligence uh, from areas that are not associated with capital risks. For example, marketing, upsell, and cross sale. If you sell something wrongly, well, it's um, a bad thing, but there's no effect on the capital. Call centers is also a great thing with voice recognition, NLP, chatbots, uh, uh, things are things that we are active in, and this will only expand. Here, the price, the, the cost of error is um, uh, low here. But if you uh, go over um, to uh, machine learning and deep machine learning in terms of risk management, then uh, we and the regulator are facing a lot of questions in terms of interpretation and validation of artificial intelligence and responsibility. Responsibility and liability is uh, a long story because the final responsibility uh, rests uh, with the managing team and uh, uh, with me as the CEO, but how do I uh, um, cascade it uh, or delegate it uh, uh, down um, uh, to the bottom? But what do you do with it if mistakes have been made? Uh, that's why we go from uh, simple to um, complex. Algo trading is also an excellent opportunity, and it is developing, but because uh, it's uh, high speed and uh, high frequency, uh, type of trading there, we do not uh, uh, move um, uh, within a wide range. And where losses are small, you can use complex algorithms uh, uh, that are not so um, certain in uh, interpretation. But when it's uh, associated with capital, we only experiment with artificial intelligence uh, for large amounts. Isn't there a contradiction here? You use a huge uh, um, uh, amount of data that is inaccessible to humans uh, in terms of speed and algorithms, but we use them for the simplest products and not for the most complex solutions. So we use the most intelligent uh, means to automate uh, the uh, uh, stupidest uh, type of work. Uh, the principle of Pareto is 20 by 80, 20% 20 of, well, 20% of your work will account for 80% of your output. In terms of cost, uh, if you optimize uh, easy work, this is 80% of our workload, whereas the heavy uh, burden of intellectual tasks uh, still remains with humans. It may not uh, uh, continue for a long time, and may, we may see this uh, uh, level um, of uh, artificial intelligence go up. A question for Alexei. What will the banks uh, turn into? Look, what uh, Alexander has mentioned about uh, robo-trading and robo-advising, these are the things uh, that uh, banks will have to constrain themselves. They stop being principals. They change their role, and uh, it is not uh, count uh, parties, but just uh, agents uh, and uh, s dealing with the account, which uh, is uh, placed somewhere else. It is offering 
services through the ecosystem that is being developed. And uh, so what do you, what's your opinion of the ecosystem that is based on the artificial intelligence from your point of view? Do you think it will be one singular or just uh, like in uh, the uh, film of the Soviet Union who used to claim that uh, there'll be nothing but TV, but he kept repeating it every 20 years? This is uh, the main question. Let me try to explain why there'll be no banks by 2030. Okay, everyone got interested right away, getting uh, vigilant. And will there be central banks? Will central bank uh, remain at least? I will explain. Let me explain you what is the process. Uh, there are certain uh, functionality, risks, uh, profitability. We remove certain segments of the customers. We do the segmentation of the customers. We form portfolios. But what is that we understand now? To take to understand the risks of the counter agents, we have to understand uh, the other risks. There's systemic risk accumulated because we do not have the sufficient data on the third party. When we say p people uh, or um, machine, we have to understand that machine are objective and people are subjective. That's why customers wants to have machine. There is a, a, you cannot bribe an algorithm. And for this uh, very reason, banks, uh, to reduce their risks, uh, they enter these uh, ecosystems. I mean data ecosystems. To feed algorithms with data, they should have uh, data collection systems. That's what the uh, central bank is doing around banks and the banks around the clients. We have two-tier system of data collection. Then banks are introducing more and more algorithms, and uh, I am sure that uh, serious and uh, important decision will be taken by the algorithm in the banks as well. Then the algorithms will be competing with the one another, just like at the exchange. There is an ecosystem of data of Sberbank and uh, Tinkov Bank, for example. And the algorithms are the same. I've been uh, dealing with algorithms for 15 years, and it is clear. So it's the war not about uh, algorithm, but uh, data. And this will be the, the winner. First, we'll see the, a lot of uh, M&A transactions uh, based on whose database is uh, better forming partnerships uh, that's uh, and Sberbank is uh, clear and they want to see their uh, clients and the customers not what the information that customers provide but uh, from uh, the outside and then the the things are simple you have uh, algorithm and uh, data collection system you are then absorbing the ecosystems and uh, at uh, some time in the future the algorithm will get uh, the system uh, the whole of the ecosystem, and we do not need an intermediary, and there will be one rate both for loans and for deposits, and I think we will forget the word interest rate. And in the lending system, it is P2P micro lending, and why should they need some complicated transactions like 30 days for a contracting, for contract? It will be one platform. Okay, uh, Alexander, Sberbank itself <coughs> is starting a project to eliminate itself. Let us ask uh, Alexander because I can I could see that he is agitated. Uh, if you want uh, to be remembered at the discussion, you can uh, say, you can claim that everything will be lost, everything will be gone. I do not agree. I think the banks will be there. And I see and I hope that both the central bank and Sberbank will stay in place. Thank you. And uh, I thought that there will be just a Moscow exchange that will stay. But of course, um, the Moscow exchange will stay will as well. Of course, there will be a war of algorithms, but uh, it's ongoing already. You just uh, compare Sberbank, Tinkoff, and uh, Alpha. We are fighting in the retaining decisions taken by algorithm. Aren't they true on the basis of the information? Of course, each of us are trying to put in some uh, things uh, to improve uh, the factor, the coefficients. But uh, at the same time, all the players and Alpha and Tinkoff uh, or have their share, but we have a risk uh, appetite, which is uh, different. And those that uh, uh, take loans uh, from uh, Tinkoff, we won't get loans in Sber Sberbank, not necessary. 
but uh, it is just uh, the purview of responsibility of the risk managers and shareholders. When there is a competition, the risk is there. And uh, otherwise, there will be one algorithm that uh, providing loans uh, for the best clients or uh, above certain cap. But what should be done with the others? The competition is a must. And uh, I think because of the competitions, the banks will be there. I think it's a competition of uh, business models uh, rather than algorithms. Of course, the algorithm is a continuation of the business models. I want to have uh, the uh, borrowers that will pay back uh, all the time, and the others are saying that I'd rather lose uh, some share of uh, the borrowers, but uh, I, I can win on increasing the interest rate. Look, everyone is saying that uh, the correct decision taken depends on the data and information, and the uh, banks are using, making their function as uh, the account holders and provider of financial services. Uh, they're skipping that just to get uh, information on the clients. And the more we develop uh, the technologies associated with the AI, the companies and uh, the systems uh, will uh, have incentives to do data phishing, to get whatever information is with, within they can put their hands on. What is the borderline and uh, where it will be shifting? What uh, would uh, be the balance uh, between privacy and the big data development? Uh, what, what is uh, the, the line between those two? What is the compromise? Will it be moving? Lee? issue right now. And I think regulators around the world are struggling with it. Uh, I think Mr. Tinkoff on the panel yesterday said that uh, there's a line between convenience and data privacy. The more convenience you want, the less data privacy you'll have. The more data privacy you want, the less convenience you'll have. Uh, I, it, it brings me back to a point I made earlier and a, and a point that I think has been reinforced by the conversation right now, which is a lot of this is context specific. Uh, I may want a lot of data privacy for myself. Uh, you may not need a lot of data privacy. You may prefer a lot of convenience. And uh, unless the banks or financial institutions are creating products and services with AI or with machine learning that can, uh, can be like a, a dial for me where I can set my privacy versus convenience settings and you can set your own privacy versus convenience settings. That, that's really, I think, where the game is going to be. The regulators will certainly make some baseline rules, but there's going to be, going to be a lot of room above those baseline rules to make decisions. And I think uh, the, the point about Spurbank having a particular client base and having a particular risk appetite versus Tinkoff having a different uh, risk appetite and client base is, is exactly that point. And, and those different clients will want to make different decisions on the issue of data privacy versus convenience. And the regulators should set some baseline, but above that baseline, there needs to be room for everybody to, to accommodate their own personal preferences. And by the way, I think the technology is there to do that. I think right now the technology is advanced uh, enough to, to allow people to, to have their own settings. It's just a question of, of, um, of the regulators setting the baseline. But I think it's a huge challenge, uh, and uh, talking about what Ivan said, the more information is collected, then the more accurate the algorithm will be in uh, solving the problem. Talking about uh, information collection, a friend of uh, my son uh, visited my friend, and he just uh, recalled that uh, his uh, parents requested him to buy some pet food and he entered my computer and uh, for some six months when I switched on the TV I receive uh, information contextual information on the pet food and uh, I am not interested in it but uh, I'm fed with that kind of information what uh, is the criteria of the truth and uh, uh, is it uh, the plethora of information that uh, solves the problem the, I understand uh, what algorithm is used uh, to uh, deal with the pet food. They use simple algorithm over there, not a complicated one. Talking about the data collection, the more data we collect, 
the more accurate we are, but here is another problem associated with it. The number of the possible images and pictures uh, is huge. We cannot collect all the pictures. And uh, the important subject uh, at the moment, uh, which is a key from the scientific uh, point of view, is the issue to which extent those uh, neuron uh, networks uh, are stable from perturbation. If yeah, just uh, be please careful with the terminology. This term, this uh, term is uh, very important. Then we'll repeat it, please. We'll put it down. Okay, universal perturbation. When we change the picture, the man doesn't see it, but the neuron network uh, is uh, in overdrive, and it believes it is. Uh, an elephant and not a, a dog. And if you, if there is a face recognition uh, system, you have universal biometry for all the country, and then uh, uh, the uh, offender distorts it, and uh, the system is ruined. And there will be arms rate. Google has uh, opened a tender related to this. Uh, to, it is uh, the tender or the competition how to learn to deceive the neural networks uh, and to protect against it. Then before announcing it for the rest of the country. They want to understand, to play in the sandbox and uh, to see it small, uh, at small scale. And uh, it is uh, the more scaled up we are, then uh, the higher sophisticated system should be. And uh, the bank might uh, buy a ready-to-use uh, technology. And if there is an, such a hacking attack, and uh, if there are no specialists in the bank uh, to defend it, uh, to cyber, uh, artificial interact uh, cyber security, then the, the more difficult is the situation. So many, it doesn't uh, matter how much data we have. It will be possible to deceive the cyber system and. Since we've started talking about the terminology, let's coin a new one. Aren't uh, the people afraid to stay so much uh, online as they are now? Because uh, if it's uh, dog food, then it just irritates. But uh, people realize that there are some more important solutions taken by somebody else, uh, by the big brother. and. Uh, won't they be willing to pay cash? Because uh, every cashless uh, payment uh, talks about uh, my uh, preferences. And I can coil uh, the term detransparization. Well, uh, closing the web ca camera, you will be uh, just a, a dark blip on the camera, and you will be obvious. And if you're just an ordinary people, Mr. John, then pay using your card, uh, you're just one of uh, the multiple. I think the, that's the safe conduct. OK, uh, we, uh, we become anonymous in being one uh, part of uh, the multiple data. True. Let's talk about uh, another risk. Every industrial uh, revolution, whether it is a steam engine or electricity or computer, and now they are talking about uh, revolution, uh, industrial revolution four, like uh, AI, affect uh, the labor market. And uh, it is not harm harmless. And they said, OK, we have uh, survived uh, through the industrial revolution. But uh, no, it's not that easy. Like, uh, read what uh, Charles Dickens used to write about re revolution, Susan. How will it affect uh, employment? What should the people do losing jobs in banks? Because uh, they do not work in the call center or they do not work in for the legal department because the chairperson of the board of directors of Sberbank, he said, I will sack fire, sorry, uh, optimize the labor because the Standard cases would be uh, resolved uh, by the AI, and uh, even the risk, uh, the uh, suits will be sent uh, to the court based on standard approaches. What should those people do? Area among economists and among policymakers. So, uh, I think there's a big concern, uh, but many of my economic professor colleagues disagree. So let me start with why we should not be concerned. If you imagine a simple 
world where we just make one good and all of us are identical and we all own a share of the factory. If that factory makes more things with less input, we're all better off. Like, how could it be bad if we can make more with less? That's the starting point, and that's why many economists are not worried about this technological progress. We're going to be richer, make more with less. Of course, not all of us own a share of the factory, and we're not all the same. And we don't all live in the same place as well. And so that's where the complications emerge. Um, recently, some economists at MIT started measuring the effects of robots. So they, they quantified the fact that when you get more robots, in general, we're all better off. So we, we make, have more robots, we make char cars more cheaply, the prices go down. All over the country, people take that money they were spending on cars and instead they go to restaurants, they get haircuts. It makes the economy more healthy. But then they looked in specific cities like Detroit, Michigan, where they make the cars. There, if you get more robots, there's a concentrated impact from losing jobs. People lose jobs in the factory, they stop going to restaurants, they stop getting their haircut, and then the local economy gets worse and worse. And those are the problems I worry about. If a bank has a large call center, and they usually put them in places that are not economically thriving, so they have cheap workers. If, you have, if you're the major employer in a small area and you close the call center, that will be, I believe, a big problem for that area. And I believe it's going to happen all over the world. One of the biggest questions I get when I go out and lecture, someone will come up to me from a bank and say, we're about to close our call center. We're gonna close our call center in one year or two years or three years. And I hear this in different countries all over the world. And the banks are concerned. They, of course, they care about the people. They care about their country. They also concerned about the regulator. <laughs> that if they cause a major problem for their country, it will be bad for regulation. And, and so I think nobody knows the answer. And that, I think, is a big problem. Academics doesn't, don't know the answer. The policymakers don't know the answer. We don't actually know how to help those areas. Maybe the people need to move. Maybe they need to move to a new city. But people don't like to move. They like their families and so on. So I think we need to take action now to, to see the places where automation, whether it's white, it's, it's information automation or robot automation, we need to anticipate that and think about whether we're gonna help people move to the cities. If they're gonna move to the cities, we need better housing, better transportation. Maybe there's many jobs in Moscow. There's many jobs in Silicon Valley, but people have to drive two hours to get to those jobs. If they're gonna stay where they are, we need to figure out what they're going to do. And of course, the automation will affect all parts of the economy, but the ones I'm worried about are places where there's not a lot of other new employment coming up, and there's many people losing their jobs at the same time. So the call centers, the tellers at the bank branches, the, um, the workers serving food in the restaurants, taking at the cash registers, the cash registers of the supermarkets, the retail stores, they're all disappearing at the same time. And so the people don't have new jobs to go into. So I want to just sound an alarm that collectively as a society, we do need to think about those people. They're going to be very unhappy if they stay where they are and they have no jobs. They, the political problems will, will be uh, severe. Indeed, it's a very um, uh, important challenge, serious challenge, because uh, um, for um, people it is better to have uh, uh, a low-paid job than none. Uh, and uh, Natalia, uh, what about costs? Uh, you uh, suggest uh, um, a certain ecosystems uh, should be, uh, and API systems should be set up. Um, 
But uh, the customization that is uh, always required for every individual business is also it's also a cost because you cannot distribute the same package to everybody. But does that mean that only the strongest and fittest will survive? Because you first need to spend something to gain something. Indeed, a very uh, this is a very philosophical question as. Uh, Darwin used to say, it's the fittest, not the strongest, that survive. I think it's a, a universal law. Only the smartest, uh, the most agile, and the fittest uh, are going to survive. But let me cite one other example, maybe not directly linked to your question. I listened to my colleagues very attentively, and what came to my mind is a use of, the, of artificial intelligence that our company is now employing to expand our discussion a little bit. SAP is a public company which is listed at uh, the stock exchange. It uh, uh, uses our projections and we need to predict uh, what our uh, revenue and margin will be and that is uh, uh, the basis for growth or decline in the price of our um, stocks. Um, our uh, projections are based uh, in the following way. They go from the bottom up. Uh, uh, this goes up to the board of directors uh, that uh, accumulate projections uh, um, for into a quarter and into a quarter forecast. And last year we began to use artificial intelligence uh, to predict this forecast. Uh, as we use our own uh, shoes, uh, um, uh, we. Uh, are a shoemaker that makes shoes for themselves. Um, that is our a SA, uh, our API system, and we have a huge uh, uh, body of data on projections and uh, actual <coughs> revenue, um, and it also incorporated uh, information on. Uh, exchange rates in various countries and certain uh, economic parameters. And last year, our prediction at the level of uh, companies and regions, the machine prediction was better than um, human. But now we brought it down to the level of countries. So when um, uh, uh, you are, when people are asked uh, for predictions um, uh, of our revenue, uh, they also see the uh, machine uh, projection. Uh, people are um, uh, people tend uh, to fall under the impact of other people's um, predictions, uh, and depending on how uh, someone uh, uh, influences me, uh, uh, whether this person. Uh, uh, wants me to say that I will make a budget uh, or whether the person wants me to um, uh, be quite honest and frank, uh, I will give different answers. And it, my behavior will be different if they want me to answer honestly or um, uh, for the purpose of some budget goal. But a machine uh, uh, is not something uh, that uh, has any uh, intention or message or agenda behind its uh, projection or question. So human predictions have become uh, far more accurate because uh, there's no influence on the machine. And of course, you could uh, break something in it, uh, but so far it's been working. Uh, fairly, and uh, I think it's a huge area for the uh, use of artificial intelligence where people can uh, <coughs> influence other people, and people's answer or response may depend on who asks the question and when. And this has to do with um, uh, bank scorings and the way I complete uh, loan papers or something, we have an impact on the answer we receive. And that's a huge area for artificial intelligence. Okay, now I'll ask the last general 
question uh, to all panelists. Please try to um, be quick answering it. Um, uh, OK, if we get a single algorithm that will uh, co come out winner and a uniform uh, ecosystem emerges uh, with no brokers or banks, uh, but based on one technology, and if there's a problem, our, uh, we will have to sue this technology, perhaps. and Or there will be certain points of uh, um, activity uh, because there are several groups that are working on creating such ecosystems uh, and there's for example a very advanced uh, government bank there's another advanced uh, private bank that um, uh, is um, that has made uh, such systems uh, and business networks its uh, major business model and there's another infrastructure which is in the middle because uh, you still need some uh, final intermediary where everybody meets uh, or comes together and uh, one which uh, uh, preserves some neutrality. So what will happen with such an ecosystem or ecosystems? How many ecosystems will there be and will there be any chance f for small broker companies to survive? Now let's start from Alexander. Thank you. Permit me to refrain from talking about ecosystems. Uh, we have uh, an expert on ecosystems. Uh, who is the right speaker for it, or I will say how I see artificial intelligence in three years. Um, I think it's uh, more pertinent to this uh, subject. P excuse me. Does anyone want to say about an ecosystem? Alexei, maybe, and then I'll ask the last question about the future, Lee. I, I think ecosystem is a really good term to use, um, but I think there are going to be always multiple ecosystems. Uh, I do a fintech podcast called Appetite for Disruption, and every different fintech company we talk with on the podcast has a different view of the way financial institutions work, way the, the way that financial technology should work, and the way that the future will look as a result of technology in financial services. Because there are so many different visions of how that will be, I suspect that a more decentralized type of ecosystem is going to prevail in the long run, uh, and that the technology will actually allow for that more decentralized ecosystem, not just because of things like blockchain and distributed ledger technology, but just because people are looking at things from very different perspectives, bringing their own expertise to bear, bring, working with a group of people who are, are thinking about things in a new and different way. And let me just make one last point on this, which is uh, Brett King's keynote from yesterday. He talked about this first principles thinking, uh, talked about trying to reimagine the way things should work from scratch as opposed to just iterating on existing principles. I think that is something that technology allows people to do in ways that it, uh, um, and in particular, uh, computer technology, machine learning, et cetera, allows people to do in ways that just have not been available at an individual level. And because it's available at that individual level or small group level, you'll have multiple ecosystems, more than you can count, and, and that's where the world is going, in, in my view. All right, we are running out of time, so maybe just a couple of uh, sentences. Natalia, I will support Lee in that uh, access to technology is so high that uh, the ecosystem will develop. But will there be uh, one, three, or 10 ecosystems? Uh, we cannot predict that because every minute new people are born and they have new neural networks. Every Elon Musk uh, uh, gives forth to a new essence uh, and uh, tomorrow another person will be born with a totally different combination or a machine will learn 
uh, itself, uh, teach itself something, and access to technology will help new entities and essences to develop. Now, Ivan, what do you think? Uh, let me just uh, make one point. Um, all our algorithms uh, are operating on supercomputers. They consume a lot of uh, energy, and in terms of energy efficiency, our brain is the most efficient uh, device, but not at that speed. Uh, well, it depends on the task. Um, well, two and two, to put two and two together, maybe yes. Well, algorithms are still invented by people, and uh, the uh, gain here is a lot bigger than uh, the gain from um, big data or new approaches. Of course, there will be a vacuum uh, cleaners that uh, suck up uh, data, but there will always be chances uh, to think up something new and uh, uh, break uh, and, and uh, take off uh, to a new level. Uh, the human brain will be uh, supported uh, uh, with these um, uh, possibilities of, the, of artificial intelligence. Now, Alexander, what about the future? Now, my pre prediction about artificial intelligence, let's follow this logic. For a long time now, all the leading banks have been making decisions concerning individuals and issuing loans on the basis of algorithms. In the past few years, uh, successful experiments uh, and industrial solutions have been adopted uh, on issuing loans to SMEs with the use of algorithms. And <coughs> I'm using the term algorithm, not machine learning and um, the rest. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, overdue levels uh, are uh, comparable to human decisions uh, as a result. And you can expect banks to use uh, more complex algorithms that could be termed as artificial, algor artificial intelligence for the uh, medium plus uh, segment. Uh, maybe not uh, for a bigger segment, but that uh, Many billions of rubles uh, will be issued in credit uh, with the use of artificial intelligence is quite uh, possible. You've got uh, input and output parameters uh, and the features and data that lead to certain types of output. Uh, everything can be um, uh, embedded in an algorithm. And within three years, the leading banks uh, will use artificial intelligence to make decisions concerning big amounts of uh, funds. And those decisions will take hours and not weeks to take like uh, it is the case now, even including big accounts, big customers, whereas for small customers, uh, it will take minutes. Um, now, most credit uh, decisions for uh, uh, SMEs will be uh, taken on the basis of artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, log regressions and linear regressions are, are of little help uh, because it's too specific and uh, based on the fact that artificial intelligence will be the basis of decision-making banks will have to uh, optimize their uh, personnel or retrain them. Um, what comes next is the model risk uh, that uh, will become the main uh, risk for banks. Uh, uh, this is w an area where we are entering into, and we will hear about uh, errors made by artificial intelligence uh, shortly. Just imagine if artificial intelligence makes decisions on, um, uh, in, in the case of big uh, uh, decisions to make, and uh, many banks, maybe not in Russia, I'm sure not that they will be in Russia, uh, will go bust because of those 
eras. And the challenges we are all faced with in the next three years, we will have to deal with them is an interpretation of the results of artificial intelligence uh, because uh, decisions of neural networks are not obvious very often and require additional uh, verification and we will have to trust or mistrust neural networks. The speed of uh, AI learning is uh, good when we know about the past, but uh, the average time to default uh, on alone can only um, be clear within two or three years, and that uh, that's a lot of time although there are mathematical solutions to that too. The preparedness of our regulator for artificial intelligence and bank uh, management is also a big question, although we are having a very progressive regulator. The responsibility of artificial intelligence is something to be defined, but um, of course, uh, the final responsibility rests with the executive command. Uh, and. Uh, social consequences uh, of artificial intelligence adopted uh, will have to be addressed, uh, as Susan has um, mentioned, and we will have to oversee uh, the uh, models of using artificial intelligence and decision making. And we uh, believe that uh, uh, biannual uh, checkups will not no longer be uh, sufficient. We'll probably have to do that uh, once every month or even online. Now, Susan, where do you see the future? Well, I agree with the comments that were just made, and I think really the big agenda is not so much on the, the science side. I think the science side will continue to incrementally improve, but where we need a much more progress is understanding how to manage algorithms and how to use them. So as they become standard inside financial institutions, we have a new discipline of managing algorithms, a discipline of regulating algorithms, and, and so on. And so what, what the manager of the algorithms will need to do is ask not just that the algorithms predict and that the algorithms classify, but they, the algorithms may need to be stable. If you use them for lending, you can't change them every week. If you change your lending criteria every week, you'll never learn about the credit risk associated with the model. So you'll need to build stable models. You'll need to, to build models that can use underlying data that changes over time. If you use signals like Twitter, well, the usage of Twitter changes from week to week and year to year. So the meaning of the underlying data changes. So you have to take that raw data and turn it into something whose meaning is more stable. We'll need to have models that sometimes are more causal. Causing, we need to understand cause and effect. I might see that hotel prices are high when hotels are full, but I can't conclude that raising prices in hotel will cause them to fill up. Of course, if you look at it, you'll see that mistake. But if these models are doing everything in a black box behind the scene, you won't realize that your model is actually implicitly assuming that raising prices fills up hotels. We'll need to have models that are not manipulable. If we use uh, Twitter data or social media data to make credit decisions, well, people can learn, read on a blog, that if they post more on LinkedIn, you know, they'll get better credit and then they start manipulating the signals. Um, we'll also need to make sure that the models tell us things that are actionable. A common application of machine learning today is to predict customers who will churn, who will quit. But maybe customers are quitting because they're moving away and you can't serve them anymore. So that's not very actionable. So you need to pr not just predict who will quit, but predict on whom you can intervene. And then finally, I think a big frontier on the science side in, in, in moving into business is our algorithms that actively learn and experiment, that, that try something and then see how it performs and the next day change their rules. But those algorithms only work when you can get a really good feedback signal that really captures what you care about. So if you imagine in wealth management, trying to have an algorithm learn what makes people happy, Maybe your algorithm will just show you pictures of a great retirement 
and the algorithm won't tell you that you're gonna be poor when you retire. And if the algorithm has to learn day to day, the only thing it can learn from is how much you click, how much you engage, but that's not really what you care about. What you care about is making people's long-term retirement successful, but you can't measure that for years. So the more we use algorithms that try to learn quickly, the more we optimize for the short term, and we won't figure out our mistakes for many years, which is why I agree with Alexander that really we can deploy these at scale for easy things like marketing, but we must be much more careful when we deploy them for giving customers advice or for lending. And it's not just we need better neural nets. We need better business management, better economics, better policy, psychology. All of those things uh, are important for using them in these longer term contexts. Susan, спасибо. У нас завершается время. Алексей, вам последнее. Thanks, Susan. We're running out of time. Alexei, the floor is to yours about the world without banks. I think the situation is even worse than we imagine. Digitalization results in three things. The democratization of products, the demonetization, ca ca uh, cashless uh, economy, and demonization of the world we have. And so the traditional barriers uh, in the economy will uh, be uh, eliminated. The traditional economy was uh, because of the limits of time and space. We are in the new world where con traditional barriers of space and time have been differentiated. We have a new world of risks and uh, fastness. and. Uh, this, how fast we take decision is the important thing of the digital economy, and the people are not ca capable of that. And so we are living in the, starting to live in the world built by machines, uh, for machines, and only the machines will help you to take uh, the overload uh, uh, res as a result of this uh, world. And I think the only the business uh, models based on algorithm will survive, and those who, who understand it will survive. And those who still think about uh, creativity will be gone. What a nightmare. OK, do, do we still have time for to take a couple of questions from the floor? I would like to ask uh, that question, to, the, to put the question to the organizers, OK? Taking two questions from the floor. Okay, thanks God. I thought that we would end on that particular note, but uh, what could we do with our natural intelligence then? Uh, thanks, colleague, for a very interesting uh, discussion. I am from lending department, and uh, after today's discussion, I will start looking for a new job. And it's a question for Alexander. Corporate uh, business. Uh, it's uh, all about uh, a relationship between people and companies, uh, owners. Uh, what about the problem of black box? When uh, systems uh, gives you the story that uh, this uh, client is a problem and there's a specific human being on the other side of the desk. And uh, you will have to explain it uh, to that person and you don't understand yourself because the decision has been given by the black box. Thanks uh, for the question. If you don't know why, you'd better not explain it. That's uh, the general message, the general answer. When the network uh, gives us a prompt, you do not talk about uh, taking a decision, but uh, a client uh, relationship. Uh, and uh, it can give you a prompt on uh, how to communicate, but you are communicating yourself. It is unlikely that the clients uh, would be willing to get in touch with the uh, bot, and uh, so they are willing to m mix uh, with human with humans so but uh, so it's too premature to look for a new job if you're interested uh, get in touch with me so looks like uh, we have uh, tangible results from our discussions any other questions if not uh, let us uh, finish the discussion and uh, i'm under the impression that uh, there are preconditions to discuss uh, this subject matter not only in the science but uh, in the other areas uh, people make are very open and, uh, to disclose inf information about themselves. There's uh, a lot of information that the business leaders are trying 
to use to optimize their business models, marketing, saving, uh, savings on uh, the salaries uh, for the lending personnel, and at the same time, they try to develop new functionality, which uh, did not exist before. But on the, on the other hand, we just uh, try to duplicate uh, the methods, uh, ways of uh, human thinking, developing those complicating neuron systems. But I think uh, neuron systems, uh, when they're perfect, uh, are very complicated. But uh, the neuron systems of, of all of us all together is also an ecosystem, and I think it will exist uh, indefinitely. Thank you.